everybody, and welcome to this XP Solutions XP Live webinar. Our presenter, Chauncey Jones, has approximately 10 years of experience in the civil engineering field with a focus on hydrologic and hydraulic design. He's, uh, he has experience in a variety of platforms such as HECRAS, HY8, HydroCAD, EPA SWIM, and of course, XP SWIM. Many of you may already know Chauncey as one of our North American support engineers. So welcome, Chauncey. Thank you, Nicole. Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar. Uh, hopefully, we're going to pass on some very helpful information to you today. Um, as was mentioned, this is diving into practical stormwater modeling techniques within XP Swim for some real world issues. We are going to take a look at some data preparation and different ways to configure your model. Um, examples would be external database linkages, uh, GIS, CAD, uh, Civil 3D, Land XML, things along those lines. We're going to touch on basic roadway drainage and how to set up a model in the software in both a solely 1D model as well as a 1D, 2D model. Uh, so we can kind of see the differences between those two model approaches. Uh, we are also going to touch on storage and some outflow control modeling techniques. Uh, those questions seem to come up relatively often, so I want to touch on that briefly. So with regard to model data and preparation, of course you can assemble your model by creating your nodes and links manually, uh, but today many jurisdictions have their existing storm systems or sanitary systems all in a GIS file or uh, other database format. Um, XP has the ability to link to those databases. You can import from directly from GIS. We can bring in previous HECRAS models. We can bring in previous EPA SWIM models. So we'll look at some of these things. With regard to GIS data, there are a couple of different ways to import this data into the model. We can see that we can simply right-click in the Layers window and import from GIS file. This will be a shape file. We can use that to create almost all the objects in the model, nodes, links, subcatchments, for example. You can also import or link to export external databases via the file menu. This, you can set up a dynamic link where the database is updated when changes are made to the model or only changes to the model. Uh, it's really your choice. Very useful tools. You can assemble a model very quickly uh, if you have the data formatted in one of these formats. With regard to the surface data, we can create the surface in the model, again using GIS shape files, ESRI grid files, XYZS files, and Land XML. Uh, you really want a detailed surface in the model, particularly if it's a 1D, 2D model. Many users will pull the node rim elevations or spill crest elevations from the surface data and begin to define their stormwater network using that surface data. So it's very important. With regard to HECRAS model import, it's literally a couple of mouse clicks. Uh, under the file menu, you can import a HECRAS data, as we see here. And if you look, we're actually importing the whole network. We could just be bringing in the cross sections, but this actually imports the entire river segment, as well as all of the section shapes that existed in the HECRAS model. And we've seen many cases um, more recently where HECRAS models have been imported into XP for the purpose of creating a 1D, 2D model, which will more accurately depict the extents of the floodplain, because the overland flow is actually modeled based on the surface features as well as the land use parameters defined by the user. With regard to roadway drainage, obviously we can have a hazard occur if there's not an appropriate stormwater conveyance system in place. Uh, careful consideration needs to be applied to the design of these systems to prevent scenarios such as the one we see here. Uh, it appears this manhole has surcharged and flooded into the intersection, and maybe we need to 
model this volume or the overland flow pattern that exists due to the flooding. And we're going to look at a couple different ways that that can be done, both in 1D and 1D 2D. With regard to 1D in XP, we have a feature that's unique to the model called dual drainage. And it allows the user to create what's called a multi-link. And up to seven different objects can be modeled. They can be conduits or diversions, uh, such as pumps, weirs, orifices, all within a single multi-link, provided they all flow in parallel. So we can see here that we have both our subsurface conduits, our manholes that come up to the street, and we have our street conduit defined within the multi-link based on this typical section. Okay, and we'll take a look at this in a 1D model as well. <clears throat> there are a couple items that are commonly misunderstood and therefore misused in the model. Uh, that's ponding and inlet capacity. So I want to touch on these two items and try to maybe clarify their definitions a little bit. Um, with regard to ponding, the default setting is none. And what this effectively does is water that leaves the node from the spill crest is actually lost from the system and leaves the model. It is, however, accounted for in the continuity calculations and it's reported in the model output file. Ponding allowed will allow the water to be stored in an artificial ponded area above the node until the capacity of the system will allow it to re-enter the 1D network. Now this ponded area by default is a very large flat, um, relatively flat area that is defined within the hydraulic job control under the junctions defaults tab. <clears throat> now typically we'll recommend you don't want to use ponding allowed in a final design model. Rather, you would use ponding allowed to maybe determine a volume that leaves the node, that floods the node, and then adequate storage should be defined at that node. And then the ponding should be reset back to none for the final model case. A couple more options exist for ponding, one of which is sealed. This applies to uh, pumps and force main systems. In this case, the hydraulic grade line is allowed to rise above the ground surface to simulate the pressure flow, but no volume leaves the network. It was lost from the system. And the remaining options are to link the node to 2D, either at the spill crest or the invert. And we will touch on that a little bit later and explain the differences between those two options. With regard to inlet capacity, this is a very commonly used function within the software <clears throat> and in particular with a dual drainage scenario. In fact, that's what it's intended for when you have both a subsurface flow as well as an overland gutter flow, street section flow scenario. When the inlet capacity is selected and defined, there's a flow split between a new node that's created and the original node that existed. And it's accomplished by using the original node to raise to the lowest connected open channel at the node. And the new node is actually connected to the closed conduit system below. So what occurs is water will approach that node. And when the inlet capacity setting is on, the original node is at the upstream end of a rating curve that's defined by the inlet capacity input by the user. And a certain amount of that flow is allowed to enter that inlet and therefore the 1D system. And the remaining flow will bypass that inlet and flow down the street section to the next node. Okay, so with this in mind, when flow is added at a node, be it a user inflow hydrograph or if it's transferred from the runoff mode, it's going to first be applied at that overland conduit. Okay. Now, you, you're typically not going to want to use ponding allowed with inlet capacity, in particular if there's no 2D grid or connected open channel, because as we can see in the second bullet, the original node adopts the closed conduit invert plus 0.001. So 
if ponding is allowed and you have inlet capacity and there's no overland flow component, instabilities are going to typically occur as it's trying to interpolate that ponded area uh, volume. <clears throat> With regard to storage and outflow control, uh, storage nodes, as we discussed briefly earlier, they can represent the volume above the spill crest of a flooded node. They can represent ponds, vaults, uh, any type of storage facility that exists online or offline in the network. Uh, in this case, we have a stepwise linear definition, and you'll note that it is measured from the spill crest. So what occurs in this case is the default manhole area, cross-sectional area, is used up to the spill crest, and then this storage definition will take over to model the ponded volume above the node. Okay, and we'll take a look at that in a 1D model. Regarding the outflow control, Again, a single multi-link can be used to model a structure such as the one shown here. Uh, just as a reminder, all flow in the multi-link is in parallel, not in series. But we're able to model the orifice, the first weir, and the second weir, all in this single multi-link, leaving a storage node, shown in this simple schematic here. <clears throat> the weir links for the, the very top weir would be either the perimeter or the circumference if it was a circular riser, something along those lines. <clears throat> so with that, I want to take a look at a 1D model. And this model was previously set up and ran in the interest of time. You'll note first that we have some multi-links constructed that represent the street flow here and we have standard links that come down to a detention pond with a structure and a riser and a culvert and then a discharge into an existing stream. So the first thing I want to show you is the inlet capacity that's defined at these nodes. There's a couple different ways that we can do this. The first node is defined with a maximum capacity only, so it's allowing 0.11 CMS to enter this node and the rest is going to run by in the overland conduit. Another option for inlet capacity is shown at the downstream node. We've defined this and rated it by the approach flow according to this particular inlet rating definition. All of these are stored in the global database, by the way. So if I edit that, we can see that it's a simple rating curve that's going to govern the flow that enters that inlet. Okay. So a number of different things can be done. You can calculate the gutter spread, uh, the, the pavement crossfall slope, um, you know, determine pretty accurately what's occurring. <clears throat> now if we look at our link, our multi-link, we can see that we have the sewer in the first conduit and the street in the second conduit. So just to verify our elevations, I'll look at the conduit profile and we can see we're well below our spill crest elevation at a relatively typical location for a storm system. All of the parameters have been entered. And if we look at our street, we'll note that our section is in place, very simple street section. And if we look at our conduit profile, it's very close to the spill crest. The real difference is the spill crest is going to be your top of curb in this case. It can be thought of as the, the end, the last vertical point of the 1D calculations. And that becomes a little more apparent and important when you have a 1D, 2D integrated model. To look at some of the results, we can explore these in a few different ways. Perhaps we look at a dynamic section view, and we can see as we play through the simulation, our sewer fills up and our street has flow because there was bypass flow from the first node. Even though these nodes aren't flooding, we still have flow in the street section. We have two maximum hydraulic grade lines shown, one for each conduit, and the blue line is the actual 
hydraulic grade line at this time step. Okay. There are, <clears throat> are other ways we can look at the results. Just reviewing the results for a single link, we see both the sewer flow and the street flow. Very minimal for that first, first link. As we move downstream in the network, we want to look at our two storage nodes here. We've mentioned them briefly in the slides. The junction node is defined with a storage that begins at the spill crest elevation for the node. So again, the default manhole cross-sectional area is used up to the spill crest elevation, and then this storage definition takes over to contain the volume that floods this node. If we were to look at the results for that node, we would see that the surface elevation is exceeded for this duration, and this volume, the cumulative overflow volume, is what is stored in the node at that point. Moving down to the pond and the structure, we're going to look at a slightly different storage definition. This storage definition begins at the node invert and extends to the node spill crest. So the pond cross-sectional area is basically increasing with each step in elevation. And we can see that our pond doesn't have an overflow. The spill crest is not exceeded. So our structure is governing the outflow from that pond node and appears to be doing it adequately. You can see we have two orifices and two weirs in this one multi-link. Now if we look at each orifice, we would see that each one has a unique name, a unique area, discharge coefficient, and a different invert elevation. Okay, 386.7 for the first orifice. Uh, we actually have two at the same elevation in this case. Just a different rectangular versus circular orifice. Okay, and again we have our weir set up for both the first weir and the overflow weir. So if we were to look at our results, we'll see we have a graph for each one of those diversions in that multi-link. Uh, and throughout the simulation, the flows, as the water surface level increases, it will be conveyed through the appropriate diversion. Nothing seems to have reached the notch. So the overflow isn't an issue in this case. Okay. From this point, I'd like to move into a discussion relating to 1D, 2D modeling to look at the same type of issue. This is going to be the project site for this particular case, and we can see there's a relatively significant urban development in this area. We have uh, natural channel streams uh, and then a municipal storm system that exists on the project site. <clears throat> so the first step in building your 1D, 2D model is to assemble the 1D model components just as you would if you were building a 1D model. So typically that will involve importing the DTM or building a DTM in the model and then creating your natural channels as we can see was done at both the south and north end of this project and your municipal storm system that exists is created as well. Typically we'll pull the channel cross sections for the natural channels from the surface data. Uh, you can do that by highlighting your link, right clicking and selecting define cross section layout. And we'll also generally pull our node spill crest elevations from the surface data because in a 1D, 2D model of this type where it is manholes and a storm sewer you want your node spill crest elevations to be exactly at the elevation adopted by your grid cell. <clears throat> and by the grid cell, I mean this. As we start to assemble our 2D model components, the first step is typically to create your 2D grid, which we've done here. It basically encompasses the entire site. And this is a blown up version of the grid with the properties dialog to display some of the different changes and settings you can 
apply to your grid. This is a five meter grid. Each grid cell is five by five and we're showing the 2D cell center elevation. I just wanted to illustrate that this each one of these cells is pulling a center elevation from the DTM data. Okay, so again it's important if you have a node within one of these cells that the elevation is exactly what is adopted by the cell. For instance if the node is higher it's going to be kind of a smokestack effect and the water will have to pool up to that elevation in the cell before it can enter the 1D network. So after the grid is created you will define your active and inactive areas in the model and only the active area cells will allow overland flow to be conveyed. <clears throat> you also have to define your 1D 2D interfaces and your linkage of the 1D nodes. Now this is where we get into linking at the spill crest or linking at the invert. Uh, typically, in a case like this, we're going to be linking the nodes at the spill crest. So as soon as the water reaches the manhole rim, for example, it's allowed to be conveyed to the 2D grid. Linking the invert would be used for the case if we have a 1D culvert that perhaps discharges to a drainage field, then as soon as water is in the invert of that downstream node, it can be conveyed to the 2D surface. And at that point, ideally, you'd want your invert at or below the 2D grid cell. <clears throat> and finally, we'd want to establish a 2D boundary condition, which is typically a head boundary. Uh, in this case, we have one defined at the downstream end of this model. And generally, the head boundary will be set up with elevations that are lower than the grid cells so that it acts as a free outfall from the 2D grid. Okay, This is a little closer look at a more completed 1D, 2D model. Here we have our active area defined in yellow. And here we have our inactive areas for the buildings. We can see building footprints are all outlined. We won't want flow to occur where the building footprints exist in this case. And we've also made the areas in our 1D channels inactive in the 2D model. This is because this volume and flow is already accounted for in the 1D model. So we wouldn't want to double count that volume in the 2D model. We can see that our 1D storm system has been defined and we have this blue polyline along the channel bank is the 1D, 2D interface. And the magenta lines stemming from the nodes are the 1D, 2D connection lines. And what this setup allows to occur is as soon as the water surface reaches the overbank elevation of the channel, it's conveyed to the 2D grid as the flooding occurs. And then the 2D overland flow equations will take over. So we will be able to see a more realistic result of what is occurring for that overland flow path. Okay, so we'll want to take a look at a 2D model. This is an example of what the results may look like for a 1D, 2D model. And we can see that it's relatively accurate. It isn't flowing into the buildings, into the structures. Um, with this, I want to take a look at a 1D, 2D model and we'll explore some of the layers that are used and some of the results. Okay, so here's our project site, as we saw on the slide. <clears throat> All of these layers are defined in the layers window. We can see under the 2D model here, over here on the left, if I highlight this and right-click, I can add a layer. And we have a, a number of items to choose from. Okay, Head boundaries, flow boundaries, head flow boundaries. There can be rainfall polygons that apply direct rainfall to the 2D surface. Uh, there's evacuation routes that be, can, can be constructed. In this case, we have our grid extents, as was shown on the slide that encompass the whole site. 
this particular user had made their grid inactive by default because they wanted to define the active area. If you make the grid active by default, you only have to define your inactive area. So it's up to you. In this case, we have an active area shown that will be analyzed in the simulation. And therefore, the inactive areas had to be defined as well. And we can see that, again, encompasses the building footprints as well as the 1D channel. And as we toggle on here, we can see the 1D, 2D interface that was created. And generally, when you're doing this, you will want to use this snap tool located at the top of the screen. And you can snap your 1D, 2D interface line to the vertices along the inactive area polygon. That same tool should be used when you're using, connecting your 1D, 2D connection lines. And it's very important that the ends of your 1D, 2D interfaces are connected with connection lines. You will receive an error when you try to run the simulation if your connection lines are not snapped to the end of your interface lines. Okay, now from here we can take a look at our head boundary. So just to show you what that looks like, if I edit the data for that head boundary, I can see that the elevation has been set at 30 meters for the duration of the simulation. And down in the bottom right, we can see our X, Y, and Z coordinate when we have surface data. So if I was to scroll the mouse along this head boundary, I can see that 30 is below every cell elevation along this head boundary. So the overland flow that reaches this point is going to be able to freely leave the 2D surface. Okay, very typical boundary condition. Another item that applies to the 2D model is very important, is your land use definitions. So I'm going to turn off some of these layers so I can show you the land use. We have a number of land use differences defined in this model. Uh, each one of them is going to have its own roughness value, infiltration parameters, things along these lines. Uh, there is a default land use that's set in the 2D job control that wherever a polygon doesn't exist, like this area for example, that's going to be the default land use. So your largest land use you want to set as your default. Okay. Now at this point we can take a look at some of the results. If we wanted to just view our maximum flooding extents, we can check this box. I have it set up to display as fill with contours. And we can see there's some issues that occurred here, but the model as a whole appears to be functioning as we would expect. Okay. Another very popular tool is to take a look at your velocity vectors. You can see with your vectors exactly how the overland flow patterns are functioning on the surface. So we'll play through the simulation for a minute and we can see what occurs. Okay, so at this point we have some flooding that's occurring. The 1D system appears to be failing and if we look at the node, at the 1D node result, which is what I'm selecting here, and graph it, we can see that at this point the surface elevation is exceeded and the 2D equations have taken over. This is now 2D flow and our maximum overflow at this node, or actually cumulative overflow rather, is shown here. So as we play through the simulation we can see exactly what's occurring on the surface. Wherever there may be eddies, uh, you know, the viscosity and velocity changes throughout the simulation. Now some of these settings are defined in the 2D job control, which is located here. 
uh, as I said, here's the viscosity information, default land use, default grid type, some of the more important tabs if we want to define our map result types. In this case, we have velocity, depth, elevation, and hazard, which is velocity times depth. There are a number of different results we can get from the 2D model, bed shear stress, for example, um, all of the symmetry, stream power, uh, very, very detailed as far as the results go. Now, the beauty of the 1D, 2D model, obviously, is we have no need to define the overland conduit in the 1D system because it is defined on the surface. So we can just snap a quick cross-section and see we have a road, a typical cross-section here. So as that water leaves the 1D system, it's already accounted for when it hits the 2D surface. Now, <clears throat> rather than using inlet capacity in a case like this, we will typically recommend what's known as 2D inflow capture. Okay, So if we look at a node, we can see the spill crest is linked to 2D. And if you wanted to restrict the flow exchange between the 1D and 2D environments, the 2D inflow capture curve can be used to do so. This can be applied locally at a node, or it can be applied globally if you choose it in the 2D model settings via this menu here. Okay, And that curve, of course, can be altered to fit um, a prescribed inlet capacity from a manufacturer. Now, a couple of the other important results for the 1D and 2D models. Uh, under the Analyze menu, we have a 2D simulation summary. This summary enables us to look at the change in volume, volume in, and volume out of the 2D model. So as you would expect, there's volume that enters the 2D model, leaves the 2D model, and we approach zero as the simulation proceeds. Very important values, the cumulative mass error. You would again expect to see a mass error generated as water enters the surface, and then it should recede and approach zero or a low value as water leaves the 2D model. Okay. Now all of this output is listed in text files as well. So if we go under the Analyze menu again, Show Output Logs, we can look at the 1D or the 2D log. For example, if we were to take a look at the 1D log, we can look at our cumulative error or continuity error listed at the end of the file. And we see that we're well within a reasonable percent. Uh, typically, we want to see a value plus or minus 2% at a maximum. Um, but some designers will allow up to 5% without much of an issue. <clears throat> so again, we have looked at solely 1D dual drainage case and a 1D, 2D model for both subsurface flows as well as overland street flow or uh, gutter flow. Thank you so much, everybody, for joining us today. We're glad to be able to go over some of these things that have come up in, in uh, support questions and that sort of thing. And uh, again, thank you for everybody who attended today. Mm -hmm.